Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this discussion on creating a virtual inauguration. My name is Aida Ross, and I am a junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics with a certificate in diplomatic studies. As a student, I've served as communications director for Fly on the Wall, a student-run geopolitics podcast. I'm the current president of the Philodemic Debate Society. For the 2020 election cycle, I took the semester off from school to work full-time as a communications and digital associate with the Biden for President campaign in the battleground state of Arizona. Our special guest today is Maju Varghese, Executive Director of the Presidential Inaugural Committee. Prior to this role, he served as the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Advisor for the Biden for President campaign and as Assistant to the President for Management and Administration in the Obama White House. The conversation today will be moderated by Mo Alethi, Executive Director of Geopolitics. Please join in our conversation by tagging at geopolitics on Twitter. And for those of you in the Zoom room, remember that you can submit your questions via the Q&A button right at the bottom. Mo, over to you. Thanks, Aida. Uh, thanks for the uh, warm introduction uh, and for your continued uh, participation and leadership at geopolitics. Always great to see you. Uh, and uh, welcome to everyone who's tuning in, both here in the Zoom, members of the Georgetown community, and anyone who may be following along online. Um, we are less than a week to go till there's a new president, vice president sworn in. And um, the it feels a little bit different this time. It felt a little bit different before last week's events because of the pandemic really changing the way the inauguration is uh, held. Uh, and so we um, wanted to bring in someone to kind of help us understand a little bit better how this all is working. And we're excited to bring in uh, Maju um, to talk with us about it. Here's how it's gonna work for those of you that are new to, to GU politics events. For the first part of the conversation, uh, Maju and I will uh, will be chatting and then we will about halfway through turn it over to the students and staff and faculty members of the Georgetown community to directly ask your questions. As, he, as Aida said, you can begin to submit your questions uh, at the Q&A tab. Someone from our team will let you know when your question is selected uh, and when it's time, you will pop up on the screen to ask your question directly. So with that, Maju, thanks so much for joining us today. I know it's a busy time for you. No, no thanks for having me, appreciate it. Um, so we were talking a little bit before, you took over Presidential Inaugural Committee, or PIC, you were named uh, the head of PIC uh, in late November after Thanksgiving. Um, I kind of like to go back to that time when you were first brought on in the middle of a pandemic, a pandemic that radically changed the way the campaign was run, knowing that um, that would likely change the way the inaugural was run how you began to wrap your head around the task before you and and what the initial thinking was about the approach. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and again, thanks everybody for, for joining and I hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy at home. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this, Mo, um, you know, uh, coming off the campaign, um, you know, we, we were very sort of focused on health and safety from the beginning. And so our approach to inaugural planning fo followed directly in line with the with the sort of North Star guideline that we had, which was you know safety first, and then you plan everything around that. And I think, and I think I've said this in other venues, when you take that approach, it makes things well. I wouldn't say easier, but it it does free you to think outside the box, and it frees you to think unconventionally. I think when you try to force the old model into the world we live in right now. Uh, I think that's where it becomes challenging. So I, I just took the approach that this is going to be different. Uh, what traditions can we hold on to? Uh, and what do we need to change in, in the interest of public health and safety? Um, and, and so that's the approach we took. Uh, the, the campaign was a good primer, obviously, for this. Uh, I was on the campaign since September of 2019. I was working in the Philadelphia HQ and, you know, back in March of 2020, when this whole when the whole world was wrapping its head around COVID, uh, we were too. And I remember going into a meeting 
to discuss our operations and what we were going to do both at HQ and in the States. And I remember we're in the throes of the primary still. Uh, Super Tuesday had passed. Uh, we were not yet the nominee. Uh, so there was still a lot of work to do, but we had to have a real honest conversation about health and like what we, what we were, like the rest of the world was trying to wrap its head around what to do. And I remember walking by a television screen and I, and it's, and it, the cry on, on on CNN was that the NBA was shutting down for the season. And I think that was the first time that a lot of us said, like, this is like, this is different and we're going to have to follow suit. We're going to have to figure out how to do this. But from that point forward, we just, we found a way to work remotely. We found a way to engage voters remotely with our phenomenal field staff. Um, our digital team just got all the more creative uh, and figured out a way to engage folks. And um, our advanced teams on the road figured out a way to design safe events uh, in the summer and into the general and, and we were able to pull, pull that off and, and, and obviously win this election. And we just took that same mindset into this planning process. And I think that's helped a lot. How do you go ahead, go, excuse me, how do you go about building uh, an, an inaugural, <coughs> you were telling me earlier, you've got a staff of about 200 or so. Yeah, a little over and, that, yeah. And, and relative to previous, um, previous inaugural, committees how big is that uh it's it's significantly smaller um i think than than some of our predecessor ones in the in the obama years um but you know that's because our physical footprint is lighter um you know we are doing some in-person activity but really almost all of it is geared toward an audience at home so a lot of our bandwidth and our energy is thrown toward digital and production uh, and other ways to plug people in from home you know, we really, really strongly encourage people to take a seat on the couch, stay warm, stay safe, uh, and, and, and kind of uh, experience it that way. I've been to a few inaugurals myself, uh, and I will tell you that as great as it was to be there, you've got the lines, you've got the crowds, you've got the travel. Uh, and so knowing this year that we're doing it in the middle of the pandemic, we just thought it was the responsible approach. And so that's what we're doing. Yeah. <coughs> Um, let's talk um, a little bit about the theme of the inaugural. Um, you have an announced theme of Americans, Uni uh, Americans United, correct? That's right. um, you know, just yesterday, our institute released a poll, um, the latest iteration of our civility poll. Um, and what we found is that people believe that right now, America is about as divided as it's ever been. It's uh, that civility as an, as it, is at an all-time low that we are more polarized than, than we've ever been. But what struck me was there was sort of a cautious optimism about the future on this front, with a majority of Americans believing that the president president elect will be at least somewhat successful in in his efforts to unite the country, and that um, the level of political division they believe will be lower a year from now than it is today. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the theme was selected, what it means to, to you guys, and how you're building out an, inaugura an inauguration that embodies that theme. Like, how are you going to project that? Sure. Um, you know, in terms of how it was selected, I, I will tell you that from the beginning, at least, you know, from the, from the outset of the campaign, uh, in the primaries and through the general, uh, you know, Joe Biden has been who he is. Uh, you know, I think that he's a he's 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 a unique character in American politics because uh, you know I think he's he's un, he's been through some very difficult personal things and he has uh, shown some steel and resolve and gotten through them. So I think he understands what it's like. I think he, his empathy level is incredibly high. Uh, I think his understanding of bringing people together, uh, of of uh, of unity, of hope even in difficult times, I think is, is, uh, is appropriate to the moment. I thought, you know, from the beginning, I joined this campaign because I thought that Joe Biden brought two things. One, uh, experience, uh, and we needed an experienced hand at the wheel. Uh, you know, and this is even pre-COVID, uh, knowing that he may inherit some challenges. But two, because I think he brought that level of em empathy and unity. And so America United is really just, a, I think, a continuation of the themes that he's been running on and the promises he has made to the country. Uh, so I think that was like a natural fit for us. Um, 
And look, in terms of how we're building this out in, in, uh, in, in, in conjunction with that theme, it, there are a few ways. Uh, I think first and foremost, it's recognizing the moment we're in, in a way that I think at the national level has not really happened. Um, and that is that, look, more than 384,000 Americans have died this year. Um, and when you wrap your head around that, uh, it is shocking and sobering. Um, and you realize that we're still in the throes of this pandemic, that yes, there are vaccines and there's hope uh, uh, for the future, but we, we, we should take a moment to reflect on what this country has been through uh, and what these frontline workers and healthcare workers have done to get us through this. Uh, and so we start on the, uh, you know, one of our events is a COVID memorial at the Lincoln, uh, where we'll be lighting uh, lights around the reflecting pool to just take a moment to remember that uh, and, to, and to encourage uh, people all, all across the country to do that, uh, to, to, to light lights in their homes, uh, their front porch, uh, iconic buildings across the country will light up as well, ringing church bells across the country, just taking a step back and remembering what we've been through, where we are, and then at the end of the day, this pandemic has touched every corner of the country, whether you're in a red state or a blue state, whether you voted for Joe Biden or you didn't, and, and just taking a moment to remember that that pandemic, you know, it has touched us all, uh, and so to remember that that, in that moment, maybe it helps bring us together. Uh, the other thing we're doing prior to that is our National Day of Service, uh, theme United We Serve. Um, obviously, right now, the need for volunteers and, and for people to lean into their communities uh, is higher than ever. You know, every, you know, the pandemic has opened up a lot of wounds, everything from uh, hunger uh, and, and, and health care, uh, you know, and I think, you know, clothing drives, coat drives, uh, folks have lost jobs, businesses. And so what we're doing there uh, is leaning in with national partners across the country to organize service events, both virtually and some safely in person. Uh, and we're encouraging people to lean in and volunteer, uh, pledging time not only on the day of service, which is January 18th in, in honor of Dr. King, but in the months and, and months to come when the country is going to really need to to get back on its feet and, and, and come together again. So those are a couple of ways where we're this whole United theme is about, you know, uh, bringing people together, but also people lifting each other up and remembering what we've all been through collectively. Uh, so there's, those are a couple of ways that, that, we're, uh, that we're trying to line up that theme and, and bring the country together the next week. I want to come back to the, to the programming uh, piece in a second, but before that, and, and actually before even that, just a reminder to the, uh, to the audience that you can begin to send us your questions, uh, just click on the tab now to begin um, uh, to get into the into the queue. Um, before we get back to the programming, I mean, as we sit here and talk about America United, we saw one of the most, you know, horribly divisive moments in our in recent history just last week, which has raised all sorts of questions, not the least of which is the security question. I know there are a lot of people out there who, who are concerned that if the U.S. Capitol can be stormed once, um, you know, uh, what's it going to be like around the inauguration, both at the Capitol and the surrounding communities? So talk a little bit about how you're approaching that and if last week changed your, your approach to it at all. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, and first off, you know, uh, I think that I've, you know, worked in politics or government for, for a long time and seeing the Capitol breached like that. Uh, it was shocking to all of us. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I think you know, I think it's something that's going to, those images, and that we're still starting to see uh, new ones every day, it feels like. Um, I think they're going to sit with us for a long time. But I think I want to remind people of a couple of things. Uh, the first is something I touched on at the beginning, which was we came into this planning process with an eye toward safety. Now, safety in both the security sense, but also the, the public health sense. And as a result, we have taken the sort of the typical footprint of an inaugural, uh, and we've, we've reduced it significantly because we don't want people to, to, to crowd. Uh, we're trying to limit people traveling to Washington. We are trying to do everything we can to not have crowds gather and have the virus spread. So that has been top of mind from the beginning. And so even in this context, this is since, since last Wednesday, 
uh, we've been in that, we've already been there. We've been in that mode. Uh, and so we continue to be there. You know, all of our events are really truly geared toward an audience from home, either watching on different platforms online or watching, you know, a network broadcast on the evening of the 20th. Uh, and, it, and it was geared that way for a reason. And, 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 you know, we've been leaning into that. The other thing I would say on security is this. Uh, the, every inauguration is deemed a national security special event. Uh, and there are very few events that get that designation. Uh, it's inaugurals, uh, it's Super Bowls, the RNC, the DNC, the UN General Assembly, uh, these large scale events uh, get that designation and that designation is important. Uh, the Secret Service serves as the lead agency responsible for developing and in implementing a security plan uh, to keep the president-elect, the vice president-elect participants and the public safe and secure. And that planning goes on for a long time. Uh, that planning started long before uh, I was named as the ED or before the pick was stood up, before this campaign was ever over. Uh, and that work has continued. Now, obviously, uh, you have seen a stepped up presence in Washington earlier than maybe we had expected as a result of these events. But I, you know, uh, and I just think that people are just, you know, standing up that infrastructure earlier uh, to be on the safe side. But, you know, we work hand in hand with our law enforcement partners um, and we lean in on them to make sure that the things we're doing are safe, uh, that the things we're doing um, are, are not putting anyone at risk. Uh, and we continue to lean in with them and they are tracking all of our movements, all of our events and all of our planning. Uh, and, and we're gonna continue to work with them on that. So, so we're under the umbrella of that NSSE designation and, and, and we're going to continue to stay uh, very close with our partners on that and, and make sure that we're communicating that out to our, uh, our staff, who obviously we want to keep safe, and our principals as well. Um, <clears throat> the surrounding community is, I mean, you know, uh, living here in Washington, right? Like, we are getting alerts all the time about how we've got to stay indoors during those few days, lots of talk about outside. Um, uh, protests and, and attempts to disrupt the day or the week um, or the results of the election. Um, and so I'm kind of curious, uh, I know the, the president, uh, the, the president elect's inaugural address is going to be carrying a lot of this, but with all of that happening around, do you put on your blinders, you know, and, and try to block that out as a pick? Do you, and just leave it to the security personnel to deal with that? Is there a message that can be conveyed with that as a backdrop? I, I'm picturing in my mind right now, the cable news split screens, right? Of, of the small footprint celebration you're planning versus potential protests. How do you lean into that or, or, or just deal with that? as your backdrop. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I don't think it's fair to say that we put on blinders. I think we're constantly asking probative questions of uh, our law enforcement partners to make sure what we're doing is, a, is safe and, and that they feel comfortable doing that and securing it. Uh, I think the other thing is, look, you know, there may be protests um, in different parts of the country. There may be protests in, in parts of, of the city um, you know, their, their law enforcement is continuing to, to plan uh, for, for the safety of everyone. And, you know, as you can see, there are road closures and perimeters going up and, and they're, you know, and they're planning for, for, for all kinds of, of, of con security contingencies. But I think it's important to remember that I think we have a responsibility um, as the inaugural committee, um, as the folks planning this, to, to remember that there are millions of people out there that just want a way forward, that want to come together, that want to solve our problems, that are suffering uh, in the throes of this pandemic, uh, that want to hear a message of hope and unity, uh, and that want to see a transfer of power uh, and want to see that happen. Um, and, and I think so, so we're, we're working to deliver on that. That's always been our goal. Again, through COVID, through, through these challenges, uh, and it's going to continue to be, but, you know, we're not blind to those things. Uh, we're ever cognizant of them. Uh, but we, you know, we're just trying to carry on our work. And again, because we didn't come into this with the approach of having large crowds, because we, you know, it, it, you know early on, I remember a, a, a friend of mine joked that uh, I was just killing all the fun. 
right? Uh, and, you know, because we, we said we weren't going to do the traditional parade, right? Because, you know, that, in, that just in all that does is encourage travel from participants and crowds and crowds gathering. Um, and, and so we've really stepped things down. Uh, and so I feel like we're scaled appropriately for this. Um, and we're continuing to make sure we are. Uh, and we're going to make sure we carry on a, a day that I think reflects what mo where most of the country is, which is, you know, they just want to look forward and figure out a way to solve our problems and get through this. Um, there's a lot of work to do after January 20th, but we, our job is to launch this administration uh, as, as strongly as we can, um, as, clear, as, as best we can, uh, and to give uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that that moment and that day, and then you know let them take it from there. All right, let's go back to the programming because I'm sure you don't like being accused of killing all the fun, but <laughs> it is good. It is going to be different, right? It's going to look different. We're not going to have a lot of the same celebratory vibe in this town that uh, you know a lot of Georgetown students um, love being in D.C. for the inauguration because of all that. They're not here, and you're not doing it the same way. So. So show us what show us the fun. Show us what the programming is going to look like, and how you're going to within the confines of the pandemic and security concerns, how you're going to create that celebratory feel. Sure, um, I, I'll tell you. I I think if I had not come off this campaign, and not just had to to help run operations on a campaign during a pandemic and figure out how to engage voters and reach millions of people, um, and get million millions of people to turn out. I would be skeptical too. But, you know, what we found throughout the campaign, uh, right through the late stages of the primary into the summer uh, and, the, and the convention and the general, was that there is another way. And it's just a matter of figuring out how to do that. Um, and I, you know, I think the model that everyone refers to uh, is the Democratic Convention. Um, I remember in conversations with friends who were working on it. Uh, thinking about a convention in which there were not going to be thousands of people in a convention center waving placards and cheering, you know, what would that feel like and what would that look like? And I think the convention team did a phenomenal job uh, of delivering engaging programming every night. Uh, and I think in some ways it might have pulled more people in to pay attention to things they probably never paid attention to before. Uh, and so we've got that team here working with us on some of that virtual programming and production. Um, and so, for example, I think one of the uh, real highlights of the convention was that roll call, right? Uh, Calamari guy is one of the most famous people in America because of that roll call. Uh, well, I think we are thinking about the parade that way. You know, what, what, is, the, what is the inaugural parade? Really is uh, a diverse set of Americans from all over the country, small towns and big cities, marching down Pennsylvania Avenue uh, in front of the entire country. Uh, but at this time, what we're doing is instead of having crowds sit in the bleachers or, or crowd along um, some barricades on the sidewalk, uh, have them sit on their couches uh, and sit at home and watch this, this uh, parade across America that our team's pulling together uh, with performances from bands and dance troops in their hometowns uh, and in their communities. Uh, and so, you know, you'll see musical acts and local bands and poets and dance troops paying homage to uh, America's heroes and frontline workers that got us through this pandemic. So it's a different way to pull you in. Um, leading into that, uh, uh, the president and the vice president will, will do a military escort, uh, which is a tradition um, that goes back to Washington. Uh, so we'll do that. That'll be sort of, that'll, they'll have a physical footprint there uh, in front of the White House uh, where they're brought in by, you know, by the military and the fife and drum corps and the military bands uh, so there's a you know there's a little bit of that kind of pomp and circumstance that we're used to just a little uh and safely and then once they enter the white house you'll get this virtual parade this parade across america and it'll flow right into that um so that is one aspect of the of the fun i would call it and, and then in the evening now typical inaugural evening you've got um uh, the balls, right? And, you know, typically you'll see a first dance at the balls and maybe performances and maybe one of the balls is carried on, on primetime television. 
So at this time, what we're going to do is some, we'll have an evening program um, with a you know, star-studded lineup uh, performing both from D.C., but also all across the country. Um, it'll be about a 90-minute program uh, carried on, on national television. Um, and again, in lieu of the balls, a way for folks to sit at home and celebrate together uh, and engage in it and, and to share the way they're engaging it with it. Um, our digital team's uh, going to roll out some stuff soon. And so, you know, these are the ways that we're trying to pull people in uh, that day for them to celebrate this moment and uh, to, to kind of have like a good, uh, a good day together, because uh, I think the country could frankly use it. Um, you just started to touch on this a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I remember uh, from the Democratic Convention, besides Kalamari guy, um, was the innovative ways that the convention used digital to, to bring people in and make them feel engaged with the convention. So that they, I, I felt like at the Democratic Convention, a lot of viewers weren't just viewers. They were, they were participants using digital tools. How are you guys using digital to create the same sort of feel this time? For the inaugural. Yeah, so you know, you'll you'll start to see some of that soon, but there will be different ways. Uh, one, I think, to sort of view the inaugural uh, and the and the ceremony. Um, you know, we're working with our partners on the hill uh, to give you a, some different vantage points uh, to to see them on 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 digital platforms as well as on television and that general sort of uh, the head on camera that we're all used to seeing. So just to give people a little different sense of that. Uh, they'll also uh, have ways for you to share the way you're viewing from home uh, with the rest of the country. Um, and then throughout our programming, you know, we will amplify that on our digital platforms and then there may be other ways to experience it. Um, so tune into uh, uh, to, to bideninaugural.org in the days to come. Uh, we'll also put up a detailed schedule of, of, of events that you can log on to and watch uh, in different ways. Um, and that's also a place, by the way, I do want to plug our team that's done phenomenal work on this day of service. Uh, if you go to bideninaugural.org backslash service, uh, you can also figure out ways to where you can plug into our day of service and, and find ways to, to help people in your own community or partner with national organizations. So there are different ways to, to engage and plug into this uh, from, from, again, the safety and security of your home. Um, in a moment, I want to turn to the student questions. Um, so again, students, feel free to um, continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab. But before I turn over to them, let's take a couple of minutes to talk about the big moment itself, the actual swearing in of the president and vice president of the inaugural address. You guys today, I believe, I believe it was just today, released sort of the program for that. And it's got its fair share of celebrities. Uh, Lady Gaga singing the national anthem, Jennifer Lopez doing a musical performance. Probably no greater celebrity to the Georgetown community than former university president, Father Leo O'Donovan, delivering the invocation. Can you just walk us through, paint a picture for us of, of how that, that moment uh, on the steps of the Capitol will look similar and different from previous inaugurations and how you're thinking about that and the inaugural address? Sure. Yeah, you know, I think it was important to us, even in this year of thinking differently, uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, to hold on to some traditions where we could, um, where we could do it safely and uh, where folks would be safe and healthy. Uh, and one of them was having a swearing in on the west front of the Capitol. Uh, it's an image that we're all used to seeing. Uh, it's an image that conveys it, that transfer of power, the peaceful transfer of power. Um, and I think, you know, after the year we've had, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, the very contentious election, uh, and then the post-election period, really leading into even last week, uh, I think it was really important for, for us uh, to, to give the country that moment and to give the country that image. Now, it's going to look different uh, because, you know, you're used to seeing thousands of people out there. You see, even the platform itself, uh, there'll be social distancing and and you know it'll be appropriately spaced in the way that a uh, at, a, at, a, at a, an event should be at this time. But we did feel it was important for the president elect and the vice president elect to take their oaths up there uh, and to do so in front of the country so they could see it from home. Uh, and also, we just thought it was important for the president elect to address the country in that setting 
uh, and, and we, you know, we were able to deliver on that. And so that was one of those, you know, when you think about the things that are going to look different, it'll look different. Uh, it'll be a similar setting, uh, but because of the pandemic, you'll, it'll feel uh, the, the, the platform will look different. But the moment was important to us and to the president elect. And so we're, we're going to we're, we're working with our partners on the Hill who have been good partners throughout this uh, to deliver on that. Um, all right, let's go to, I've got a bunch more questions, but I may sprinkle them in. Let's get to the really good questions now, and those are the ones from the members of the Georgetown community. Again, uh, when I call your name, uh, you'll be on screen. Uh, introduce yourself, telling us who you are, your Georgetown affiliation, school year, staff, um, and where you're Zooming in from. And so with that, let's go to our first question, uh, and it's from Mateo. Mateo, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming to speak today. My name is Mateo. Uh, I'm a sophomore at Georgetown College studying government and classics. Um, I'm very excited about Joe Biden's focus on unity. It's very refreshing to say the very least. Um, my question for you is, in the concept of unity, how is Biden's team reaching out to people on the other side of the aisle? How are they incorporating people of both of, of all political spectrums into the inaugural process and in the beginning of his of his term, well, what what specific actions, what ways has he already done or plans to do to incorporate people of of all political ideologies? Yeah, and no, I think that's a great question, in particular in the times what we live in. I'll speak to the inaugural uh, and not necessarily maybe uh, sort of the, the, the administration or policy side. Uh, you know, as I said earlier. We, we thought it was important um, as the inaugural committee, but I think the president-elect, that we do things throughout the week uh, to remind Americans that we're bound together. Um, as I said earlier, this day of service is a reminder that we are bound together, uh, that we've got to lift each other up throughout this, uh, through the challenges that we're facing right now. And that frankly, there have been people doing that all along, um, frontline workers in your grocery stores and your pharmacies, uh, as well as healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and other hospital staff who've, who've, who've taken care of so many people. And in some instances have been the only link uh, some of these patients have to, to people because of COVID. Uh, and so they serve as not just medical care, but also family and, and, and social care too. Uh, so we wanna make sure to lift those people up and, and regardless of party, regardless of region, regardless of who they voted for, uh, that we're all bound together throughout this. Uh, the COVID memorial, as I mentioned earlier, is another, is another opportunity to do that. Um, you know, people have lost their lives and, uh, and, and regardless of who, what party they were affiliated with or what region of the country they lived in, uh, this pandemic has ravaged communities across the country. And we thought it was appropriate leading into this inauguration to take a step back and remember that. And the president-elect has talked, you know, a lot about this throughout the campaign. Um, and he has acknowledged the, the hole in people's hearts after loss or the empty seat at a, at a dinner table. Uh, I think he has a unique perspective on that. Uh, and so it was important for us to do that. Um, you know, on that platform at the Capitol, there will be members of both parties uh, who will be taking part in this ceremony. And that was important. And that's another reason why we wanted to do this. Um, you know, at Arlington National Cemetery, uh, the president-elect and the vice president-elect will lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier after the swearing-in, but joining them there will be Presidents Obama, Bush, and Clinton, uh, presidents of both parties, coming together uh, as, an, as a new president is sworn in, and then taking a moment to reflect and honor the men and women who served our country and who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And again, because that shouldn't know the bounds of party. So, you know, there, these are the ways that we are trying to both from a, you know, thematic and image standpoint, but also some, you know, substantively uh, deliver on that message of, of unity, um, that bringing people together from both sides right now is important. Uh, and there are people who want to do that and want to join us in that effort. And so we're, we're welcoming them into that. Thanks for the question, Mateo. Um, all right, next we've got a question from John. John, introduce yourself. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for everything you're doing. My name is John. I'm with the Biotechnology Graduate Program. 
Uh, first off, I hope you're as excited for the 2021 Mets season as you are for the Biden presidency. Um, my question is, uh, what is the, the best way that students can support, help, volunteer uh, during the inauguration and the early days of the administration? And feel free to say, please stay home as your answer. Sure. Um, you, you might win favorite questioner because you've mentioned my favorite sports team. Um, Joe Biden winning the presidency and the Mets getting a new owner in the same year is like, you know, hitting, a, hitting the lottery. So I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, the ways students can plug in are, are, are there are a variety of ways. Uh, I think first and foremost, um, I think plugging in to this National Day of Service would be really, really important. And I think a, a good use of, of people's time. Um, our team has been working with uh, service leaders and, and community members and local and national partners on ways to plug in virtually. Uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of things you can do uh, from, from home uh, to help uh, communities in need. And we are holding trainings and, and, and events around that. Um, so again, bideninaugural.org backslash service to look into ways to plug into that. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is um, uh, we are, we, we have this installation uh, on the National Mall. Uh, it's a field of flags. Uh, and part of that is, 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 is in recognition of a couple of things. Uh, I think the first is that, you know, this isn't a normal year. Now, I, I remember being at uh, Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009, standing on the National Mall and being shoulder to shoulder with other Americans, uh, waving our flags. And, I, and I, I remember one of the striking images for me that day was turning around and, and, the, and the sun was, was bright at, at a, right around noon. And seeing those flags waving in the, in, in, in the sunlight. And so what, we, what we're doing is we're putting nearly 200,000 US flags of varying sizes on the mall. And you can become a symbolic uh, sponsor of one of those flags and donate to a service partner that's involved in the National Day of Service with us um, in, in a way that both helps, um, helps that organization take care of uh, people in, in, who are struggling right now but also kind of plugs you in uh, as a symbolic sponsor of a flag that maybe you would have held on the mall in a, in a non-pandemic year. Uh, so it was important for us to do that. Uh, there'll be, like I said, 200,000 uh, US flags of varying sizes, uh, including flags representing every state and territory and, and 56 pillars of light uh, representing those states and territories. Uh, and so, you know, there are different ways that you can plug in. And again, on the stay home uh, idea, I. I Everything we're doing is geared for you to stay home. Everything we're doing is geared for you to plug in and enjoy from home, from, from our day of service uh, to the COVID memorial, uh, to the uh, events on the 20th, right into the evening of the 20th, uh, and, that, and, that, uh, and that concert. Uh, all of it is geared toward uh, you staying safe, staying home, uh, and uh, you know, just acknowledging where we are. It's the responsible thing to do. Uh, so we encourage everyone to do that. Thanks for your question. Thanks for the question, John. Okay, next, uh, let's bring back Aida. Hi, I'm Aida. I was just here. Good to see y'all again. Um, so my question is, um, given the actions by the Trump administration, especially the events over the past year, while the message of unity is hopeful, there's still a serious undertone to the inauguration and what it represents in terms of just how much work there is to do in America. So how is the committee planning to engage marginalized communities, especially in the DC area, in a way that doesn't gloss over issues like racial injustice and white supremacy that we've seen um, so prevalent? Sure, no, that's, a, that's an excellent question. You know, we've had, we've had a really challenging year. You know, when I think about the campaign, you know, one of the, one of the joys of working on a campaign is that you're right in the middle of, of history. But one of the challenges of working on a campaign is that you're also sort of subject to whatever is going on in the world around you and you've got to adapt. In this case, it was the pandemic um, and the calls for racial justice over the summer. Um, and you know, the campaign was happening right around that. Campaigns don't happen in a vacuum. And it's important to acknowledge that. And, and inaugurals don't happen in a vacuum either. Um, so what we're looking to do is uh, 
and I think that the day of service is an example of that. Uh, you know, we're, we're partnering with organizations all across the country, um, organizations that are working on issues like racial justice, hunger, um, uh, providing shelter and, and food for, for members of their community. Uh, because we know that, you know, there are communities, particularly uh, communities of color, who have been uh, hit really, really hard as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and so uh, we're leaning into that. Uh, and making sure that uh, as we enter this new administration, that we're not forgetting uh, those communities, uh, communities that that could use the assistance of Americans across the country. And look, I think it's important to remember this. Uh, there are people who are really, really hungry to help, and they, they just don't know how. Uh, and part of the responsibility we feel is one of the things we saw during the campaign was that you know when we went virtual, and a lot of our foot, foot, physical footprint was reduced, there was a question of how, how are engaged are people gonna be from their communities and their homes? And the answer was they were extremely engaged and extremely plugged in. And so there's all this untapped energy out there. You know, people are sitting at home and they're watching cable news and I'm sure their minds are racing. And, but you know, what I hear from a lot of my friends is well, what can I do? How do I help? And this year, I think for the first time as someone working on a campaign, my friends weren't just asking about like, where do I vote? They weren't just asking about how do I donate? They were like, what do I do to help people who are, you know, suffering from this pandemic? How do I get PPE to people? I work in healthcare. How do I do that? Or I know a medical supplier. How do I, how do I get this in the right hands? How do I get these to nursing homes? Um, what can we do to, to help people's lives, make people's lives better? And I think what we've found is that there's a real hunger to help but in this world that we live in, I think people just need a push and sh to show them a way. And I think our day of service is, is all about that. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, next up, we've got Christian. Christian, introduce yourself. Uh, Christian, you may be on mute. Not hearing you. Sorry. Um, okay. While while we try to sort out Christian's audio issue, um, let's go to the next one and see if we can come back to him. Um, Christian, you want to try one more time? Okay. Does, does oh, there we go. Okay, we got you now. Okay. Let's try it that way. Okay, so good morning. I'm Chris Wagner. I'm on a faculty here at SFS with Georgetown uh, University. And I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. So I'm wondering, we all uh, bemoan the loss of the campus, the inequality that's amplified with that. But we also realize there are some advantages of being uh, virtual. So to be able to more globally connect. And I wonder uh, what kind of advantages you see of having now a uh, virtual inauguration. Things as people may have more access to being really part of it, to interact more closely, to interact with one another maybe more easily than only that group who is privileged to be on the mall. So what kind of advantages do you see can be now harvest from that virtual inauguration? Uh, that's an excellent question, and thank you. Uh, yeah, I think there are there are several advantages, and I think we found this through the campaign, and I think we're finding it now. You know, I I remember, as I said earlier, when I was you know Mr. No Fun early, um, my friends were like, "Well, this has got to be easier, right? Because you're scaled back now, and so that's got to be less work." And and what I tried to emphasize to them was one, no, uh, the bags under my eyes will tell you that is not true. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, I think what we're doing here is actually incredibly ambitious. It is remarkably ambitious because what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull people together when we can't physically do it. Um, and that is, you know, I grew up in politics doing advance work. Uh, my bread and butter was getting as many people as I could to an event, onto a field somewhere where we had a rally and we had these photos with people and that was us conveying that image of people being together and, and, and energy. How do you do that in this world? 
we're doing that isn't necessarily the best thing to do, given that we're in the throes of a public health crisis. But I think in a way, as, as you mentioned in the question, it actually opens the door to people who normally would not have had the maybe the ability or the time to travel because of work or finances, uh, people who would not normally be connected to an inauguration in the same way, in the same way that people paid attention to the convention because it was virtual. I think people will be paying more attention to this inauguration and more plugged into the messages, uh, the symbols, uh, and ways that they can plug in themselves than they would have been if it was just another run-of-the-mill inauguration where some people were there and some people might tune in from home. I think, it, I think it's going to have a different feel. And I think, in a way, this can be more inclusive, and I think it will be more inclusive than a typical inauguration where uh, you've got people traveling and you've got crowds and you've got some people who maybe feel disengaged because it's geared toward those people who are in the room or at the balls or on the mall or somewhere else. And this time, everything is literally geared toward you at home. It is literally geared to pull you in uh, and it's geared, it's geared to give you ex an experience at home. So I feel like this could be, and I think this could change the way maybe people think about these sorts of events going forward uh, and, and maybe help think people think unconventionally uh, about, about these sort of large scale events. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, about the possibilities here. And I'm really excited about the creative team that we have and the type of things are going to bring you. So I'm, I, like I said, there's an ambition to this that I think people underestimate um, because, you know, divisive campaign, divisive post-election period, millions of people turned out to vote. So they are clearly engaged uh, and we, we owe them a, a moment like this. And I think we can deliver that virtually. So thanks, Christian, for your question. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, let's uh, go to Matt. Hey, Maju, good to see you. Uh, Matt Percy, I, I'm pursuing a master's in public policy and an MBA. Also happen to be one of your former interns uh, at the White House. So great to see you. Um, thanks for being here. So my question is, uh, is that this is, it's actually a follow-up really from the, from the previous question and that this is an inauguration like no other uh, with a lot of opportunities to change things. Um, so in what ways do you think that this may set a precedent for future inaugurations? Sure, uh, and, and it's good to see you, Matt. Uh, yeah, Matt was one of our interns sat right outside my office uh, for a while. Uh, so good to see you. Hope you're doing okay. Um, yeah, I think, look, I think this may change the way people look at things. I think, uh, you know, maybe people will ask themselves uh, if certain in-person events are, are necessary or, or can you scale them down and maybe geared, again, toward an audience that can watch from home and have a maybe more inclusive event where it feels like you're pulling more people in. Um, so it doesn't feel like just some people who are connected to it. Uh, I have friends who go to every inauguration, despite no matter who, who gets sworn in because they wanna be part of history and part of that moment, but not everyone has that option. Uh, not everyone has the means, not everyone has the time. Um, so you know, maybe this is a new way to look at things. And I think it's gonna be a new way to look at all events. Look, we've, we've seen everyone try to adopt to this new environment. Um, entertainment, sports, um, politics. I think that, you know, people are finding new and creative ways to deliver content. I think it has opened a door that I don't think will close. Look, I think we're all hungry for the day. I know I am, where I can go to a concert, where I can sit in a ballpark, um, where we can all be together and, and celebrate together. Uh, but I think that this has opened the door to doing things a little bit differently. and you know, maybe we'll have the best of both worlds. Maybe we'll find a way to get crowds together again and do it safely, but also parallel to that, uh, create events that are more inclusive because you're pulling more people in from home or digitally. And, and suddenly you've got, you know, the best of both worlds as a result of this. So, I mean, and that's my hope. Um, I didn't know much about virtual events or production coming into this. Um, and I've seen how much bandwidth and how much work and creativity goes into it. Uh, and I'm, I am awestruck by the talent and the creativity of our digital teams and our production teams and the things that they have been able to do. And I think that they are setting a high bar uh, for the future. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt. We're coming up uh, on the end of our time and I know you've got a lot going on. So let me close out with two just final questions. One, we, haven't, we spent a lot of time talking about the inaugural 
obviously one of the the sort of the, the highlight moment is the inaugural address. What can you tell us about it? Anything you can you can preview for us about what to expect? Uh, not not really. Um, I think you'll see some <laughs> of that in the days to come. Um, I don't want to get out of heaven anymore. But I will say this: I I you know I won't be knowing what I haven't know about Joe Biden and and seeing what I have seen. Uh, I think you it'll be. Uh, both hopeful and optimistic, but also like honest um, about the moment we're in and the challenges we face. You know, I don't think he's ever shied away from that. Um, and I also know that he's a hopeful and optimistic person. And so I think you're going to see a, a message of both of those things. Uh, and I think, look, the entire, the, this whole America United theme, I know there are folks who are skeptical of that theme. And I don't blame them based on where we are, but I don't know another way. And I say that not as someone who's the executive director of the inaugural committee. I say that as a, an American, as a father, uh, as the son of immigrant parents. Uh, I don't know another way, uh, you know, and so we've got to figure this out. Uh, I, I, I'll say this from a personal note. Um, you know, the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you about planning a presidential inauguration 40-some-odd uh, years after my parents came to this country, uh, the fact that I've worked in, in the White House, the fact that, you know, I'm talking to you about this, uh, it's, it reminds me that we are better than some of the stuff we're seeing and that we are at our core a country of hope and opportunity. And I, I, I don't say that to, to whitewash away problems. I say that as someone who has lived it, who has seen people do it. Um, it's the story of my life. Uh, and so, you know, I, 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 I remind myself of that personally every day with you on that 100 percent. okay final thing you've touched on it already people that want to get involved where do they go to watch where do they go to to get involved beyond that sure for sure um so again i think in the days to come you know we are we, as you see we are rolling out our programming we're rolling out the talent associated with our programming so you'll see you'll see some more news out of us but if you ever just want to continue to follow go to bidenaugural.org um, we'll, we'll have details for the, the events that we've announced and the, and the, the events to come. We have some digital and, and, and virtual events that are coming up. So, you know, stay tuned for those. Um, and again, the day of service is another way to plug in and you can do that on our website as well. Uh, and there will be opportunities for you to engage and plug in and experience this inauguration differently. Um, so make sure you're, you're staying, you know, you're following us on social media. Uh, you're checking out the website uh, and we'll continue to keep you posted. Our digital team is um, has been working really, really hard uh, for ways to plug people in. They've learned a lot of lessons over the last year or so. Uh, and so look for those uh, those things to be applied to this and to, to, to give you an experience from home. And look, I know that uh, we would all love to be out there uh, crowded together and, 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 and having a moment. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't want you to think we can't have a moment because we can't do that. In fact, I think we're going to deliver that. And I think um, people can come away. And my, my hope is from the 20th feeling better about where we are as a country. Again, acknowledging the issues we have and all the work and healing there is to do, but that there is hope. Uh, and then in this new year with this new administration, there is a way forward and we're going to we're going to get there. But if we're going to do it, we got to all do this thing together. Uh, and so that is what you're going to keep hearing about over the next few days. Maja, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today in a very, very busy period. Um, good luck with next week and everything that you've got to accomplish. Uh, we're all going to be watching. For the members of the Georgetown community, thank you for spending part of your, your day with us. Um, keep an eye out uh, on our social media and our newsletter. Uh, if you participated at all in any of our election programming, the debate, the virtual debate watch parties we did, the virtual election night watch parties that we did, we are planning a virtual inaugural watch party where we can come together as a community, regardless of who we supported in the election, where we can come together as a Georgetown community to commemorate this uh, time-honored tradition of the peaceful transition of power and where we'll be able to chat throughout and talk about what it means uh, in real time. So stay tuned. We'll be announcing information on that in the coming days. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Maju, and um, uh, stay tuned for more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.